just off the side of the road sat a grand white house called Sharswood, silently holding secrets from the past, waiting for a new owner to uncover them. Sounds like the opening line of a Southern Gothic novel, but as we first reported in May of last year, this story is about a real family and a real house, this country's history, and a man who found himself at the center of far more than he had bargained for. The man is Fred Miller, a 57-year-old Air Force veteran who was looking to buy property in his Virginia hometown for his large extended family's frequent get-togethers. He had never heard the name Sharswood, and yet this old house would lead him on a journey of discovery with surprises and revelations that seem both impossible and inevitable all at once. These are the gentle hills of Pittsylvania County, Virginia, quiet rural farm country near the North Carolina border that once produced more tobacco than any county in the state. Hey, we're gonna gather up in uh, this one here mainly. Fred Miller grew up here in a close family that likes getting together regularly for birthdays, fish fries, and as his cousin Adam Miller told us, just about anything. You play games and you do like a lot of food competitions. And I hear the food is mainly cake. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Cakes. Too, Too many, many cakes. cakes. Fred's cousin Tanya Miller Pope and his sister Deborah Coles told us it's a big family. Fred's mother, Betty, and his aunt, Brenda, were two of 11. How many cousins? Oh, oh my God. Oh, my oh, God. God. Oh, my God. Oh, At least 100. <laughs> so no wonder Fred needed to find yes. a big yeah, place. Exactly. Yeah. Fred lives in California, where he works as a civil engineer for the Air Force. But he visits the family in Virginia often. One day, out of the blue, my sister called me and told me about a big house up the road for sale. This sister right yeah. here? Yeah. Karen Dixon Rexroth, Fred's baby sister, had spotted it. Me and my mom was riding past the house and I saw the first sale sign. I said, oh my goodness, we have to get this house. I called Fred, Fred, this house is for sale. He's like, what house? I said, you know the house, the, the scary house, I call it. <laughs> the scary house was less than a mile up the road from their mom's. They passed it every day as kids on their way to school. What did you know about Sharswood? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. No. Nothing. nothing. No. I just no. knew it was a house. A, a, house. a big yes. house. He was debating, should we put in a bid for it? I said, yes, absolutely. Let's do it. Did she twist your arm? <laughs> Took all the twisting she could do. I, I, I didn't want to buy it. But thinking his bid would be rejected anyway, he made an offer of just above the $220,000 asking price. Why did you think they weren't going to accept the offer? Well, I mean, I'm not, I, initially to me, I thought that because I was black that they would never, surely they would never sell this house to someone that's black. So for us to be able to own this thing, I thought it would never happen uh, in a million mm -hmm. years. So guess so. what happened? A million years. A million years. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. We used to always see this house out here. So in May of 2020, Fred Miller purchased the fully furnished house plus 10 and a half acres of land from a family called the Thompsons who had owned it since 1917. The first time I drove up to the place, all I could do was stop at the edge of the road there and just look up in mm -hmm. amazement, like, wow, this is, this is mine. This is an original room from the 1800s. Karen says she got obsessed with the house spending nights and weekends so online researching yeah, its secrets. A hiding spot, Ooh. they say, was from the Civil War, so they would hide the valuables. A secret hiding spot. Yeah, secret hiding spot. She discovered the house had been built around 1850 in the Gothic Revival style by a well-known New York architect. And she learned and told her family that its name had been Sharswood. Every day, she was calling me with new information. I'm like, my goodness, okay, relax. <laughs> Are you exaggerating? <laughs> you know, I'm exaggerating. You know? But then Karen turned up something that stunned her. In the 1800s, Sharswood had been the seat of a major 1,300-acre plantation, one of the larger ones in the county. What did you think of you owning a plantation? I was a little bit 
a little shocked by that, I would say, because mm -hmm. I just wanted somewhere to have family gathering. Mm -hmm. When I found out that it was a plantation, and then I'm like, okay, Fred just bought a plantation. Right. I was like, we own it. Yeah, we own it. Yeah, it's a lot. We own it. Yeah, what are we going to do up there? So it was just um, a feeling of just um, power. It was just a powerful feeling. It is. Yeah. Powerful, but of course, plantation implies slavery. And before the Civil War, Pennsylvania County held more than 14,000 enslaved people. The state of Virginia, just under 500,000. I said, do you realize what this is? They didn't have a clue. Dexter Miller, one of Fred and Karen's many second cousins, knew something about Charleswood because years ago, he'd been co-workers with Bill Thompson, whose family then owned it. Bill joined us for a conversation on what used to be his childhood porch. You grew up in this house. I did. This was my home. He inherited much of the farmland and still lives up the road. His sister inherited the house and sold it to Fred. You know, when Fred was buying the house, he did not think that the house would be sold to a black person. Why would you think that, Fred? Um, because, you know, it's, I mean, we are in rural Virginia, right? Well, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> For years, Dexter and another second cousin, Sonia Womack Miranda, had been trying to piece together the Miller family's origins, a notoriously difficult task for African Americans because records are hard to come by, especially before 1865. It really was a hobby. It was addictive. <laughs> it, it was addicted. It really like was. Private eyes. Yeah. Yes. And the land records. They've jazz, been able to trace jazz, the whole yeah. Miller clan like back crazy. to one woman. It's Dexter's great grandmother. It's my great great grandmother, Sarah. Sarah Miller. Mm -hmm. Yes. They had found a picture of Sarah Miller. This is Sarah right here. This is and they'd gotten hold of her death certificate, which showed that she'd been born in Pennsylvania County in 1868 just three years after the end of the Civil War. And they found an even better resource, one of their oldest living relatives, a beloved former school teacher named Marion Keyes. Miss Keyes, as everyone here calls her, recently turned 90. Sarah Miller is the matriarch of the family. Yes, she, yes, she was. Did you know her? Yes, I did. Well, tell us about her. She would always be out there with a broom in her hand, and then she would be waiting for us. Marion Keyes remembers her great-grandmother, Sarah, as a force to be reckoned with. What she wanted you to know, you were going to know it. Was she, she was... persnickety, as they yes, say? Was yes, she difficult? yes. Difficult? Stern? Very, very. She didn't, she didn't play. She didn't play. But we loved her. But that's where Miss Keyes' knowledge of Miller family history ended. She didn't know anything about the generations before emancipation. When you were growing up, what did you learn or hear from your parents about slavery? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. They did not talk about it. I don't know whether they were afraid, whether it was too miserable or painful, or they wanted to forget it. I don't know. But they did not talk to us about it at all. And we didn't ask them questions about it. Why not? We were afraid to. <laughs> we heard that again and again from members of the Miller family. Slavery wasn't mentioned at all. Was there almost a code? We don't talk about slavery, so nobody did. It was something uh, that every black person knew you didn't talk about. The parents would tell you not to discuss grown people business. That's what they'll tell you. The first time slavery was discussed was, uh, I guess, in the 70s when Roots came, the movie Roots came about. That's the first time mm -hmm. when Roots was on television? Mm -hmm. Did you read about it in school? M not much. Yeah. His family also remembers Roots as pivotal. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think yes. that's, that's, that's all of That's when we I all, all that felt mm -hmm. like that. That was an eye-opener. Yeah. But even after Roots, you didn't go and say, what about our family? No, no even not then, at all. What held you back? I just I, didn't think they wanted to talk about it. But didn't you want to know? I would love to have known. I would love to have known. Fred's purchase of Sharswood was about to give him a crash course in his hometown's slavery roots. 
It started with a call from two archaeologists who wanted to come do research. We're prehistoric preservationists. And so, you know, we start from the idea that these places matter. Dennis Pogue once worked at Mount Vernon, Doug Sanford at Monticello. They asked if they could come explore Sharswood, but they weren't interested in the ornate house designed by that famous architect. What they cared about was the dilapidated building with the tin roof past the big oak tree behind it. They suspected it had once been slave quarters. There were once hundreds of thousands of these buildings. These were one of the most common types of architecture in Virginia. Let me give you the running dimensions. But now these buildings are rare, with fewer than 1,500 believed to be no. still standing. You know, and Pogue and Sanford started a project to search for them. So one, two, three, four. Fred and Karen invited them to come so, investigate. They guys. examined, measured, and searched for clues. You can see the siding is. They showed us some of what they found. These are the kind of nails that we expect to see on buildings before 1800. Handmade, wrought nails. Handmade. You can actually see the hammer strokes on the head. Is this the original siding? These are remnants of the original siding, absolutely. Okay. They worked from noon to dusk and finally gave Karen and Fred their conclusion. Okay, so this it's got a complex be... history, but we think part of that yeah. history, a big part of that history, was it was a, a quarter for enslaved folks. And then it create the they say doors, it's one of the best uh, preserved the they've seen. The they believe the it was originally built in the late 1700s oh as a house for a white family. That's where the original door was. And was later divided into two separate, single-room slave dwellings. Two families. Yeah, one household here, another enslaved household over there. It just showed that it was two different worlds. Mm -hmm. This front big, beautiful world here in lavish, and you go right behind the house, and it was a whole different story. It's kind of crazy for me, just even walking around out there. Do you own that? Do you own the slave house, too? I own the slave house. I do. <laughs> it's mine. Wow. <laughs> Fred Miller's purchase continues to surprise his family and intrigue historians when we come back. When Fred Miller unwittingly purchased what he now knows to be the Sharswood Plantation House, with slave quarters just behind it. He knew virtually nothing about his own family history. He'd always assumed his ancestors had been enslaved, but it felt to him like an unknowable part of a distant past. Learning about his great-grandmother, Sarah Miller, whom his mother had known as a child, piqued his interest. So when he found out her house was still standing just a few miles away from Sharswood, he asked his mother, Betty Dixon, to go there with him. All right, we're gonna walk down through here. Betty's grandmother, Sarah, had been the first of their ancestors to be born into freedom shortly after the Civil War. That's that my father's cabin didn't have no light, no electricity. Betty remembers visiting and spending the night here with her grandmother and cousins. Whoa, what is the one room? Sarah's house didn't look much bigger than the slave dwelling. Just a single room with a smaller one above it and no indoor plumbing. Come a long ways, huh? Sure did. Glad I didn't have to live in here. Well, you had to make it work. You want a piece of this wallpaper to take with you? Yeah. Well, I hope the landlord don't say nothing. <laughs> oh, Lord, there you go. Sarah Miller is buried in the cemetery of the church the Miller family still attends. I'm glad I, now I can actually come in and see yeah. this thing. But unbeknownst to this Miller family, just five miles up the road in a different church cemetery was a tombstone that also read Miller, a far older one with names Fred and his family had never heard of, but were about to. In Karen's search for information about Sharswood, she found a document that mentioned them. It gave the names of the original owners, who was Nathaniel Crenshaw Miller and also Charles Edwin Miller. Miller? So yes, Miller. 
Any light bulbs? Any <laughs> wires connect? No, yeah, not at that me, point. At that time, not at that didn't. point, it did it not. Did Others had suspected a connection between the two sets of Millers. Because I was telling Dexter back in 88, I knew Bill that. Thompson says he had mentioned the thought to Dexter 30 years ago. What we had been taught in high school was that when they freed the slaves, they just took the last name of the person that was there, which was Miller. I just said, told Dexter, Dexter, it's a good chance that your ancestors came off of this farm. He did. He said that. So you knew that this was a plantation? I did. Well, Fred, you said you didn't know. I had no idea. Dexter, you didn't tell Fred. I did not tell Fred. I did not tell anyone. Dexter says he'd kept it to himself because he hadn't found any way to prove it. And that's where this becomes a detective story, with the Miller cousins now on a mission to figure out whether it could be possible that their own ancestors might have been enslaved on the very property Fred now owned. The first step was figuring out who their last enslaved ancestors were. And Sarah Miller's death certificate held the answer. The names of her parents, David and Violet Miller, who would have been adults at the time of emancipation. Did you know anything about them? Not at all. Not at all. I didn't know anything about them. We didn't. Even Marion Keyes, who knew Sarah Miller, had never heard their names. Nothing. Wow. Sure didn't. I just, I, I want everybody to know. I Enter Carice Luck Brimmer, a local historian and genealogist. Karen reached out to her to see if she could help. What are the special challenges looking for the ancestors of African Americans? African Americans were not listed by name until the 1870 census. So before that, they were just a number. I mean, if they were enslaved, they yes. weren't listed at all. So really, you're just looking for any type of tips and clues that you can. She started by looking at 1860 records for Sharswood's yes, then owner, N.C. for Nathaniel Crenshaw Miller. There he is. And see Miller right there. Okay. Yeah, he had 58 slaves here. Yeah. But with only and so, age and gender listed, you have enslaved people 69, 44, 34, and not a single name. No name. There names. was no way of knowing whether Violet and David were among them. So Carice looked up David and Violet Miller in the 1870 census, the first one after the Civil War where they finally appeared by name. It showed they were farmhands, that they couldn't read or write, and it listed their children, including, as Carice showed us, a very young Sarah Miller. There's Sarah. She's mm -hmm. one year old. One years old. And this looks like Emily. Yes. She's three. And here's Samuel. Yeah. He's five. To Carice, that meant Samuel, Sarah's older brother, was born before emancipation. So Carice searched for him in another historical record called the Virginia Slave Birth Index, where slave owners had to list births on their property. This document. And there, document. under N.C. Miller's name. N.C. Right. And there's Samuel. Oh. Was Samuel. And look at that. Oh, my God. List Violet as his mother. It was the genealogy equivalent of a smoking gun. Yes. So this is proof that Violet, Sarah's mother, mm -hmm. was enslaved by yes. N.C. Miller. Yes. And this is absolute proof. This is absolute, definite proof. Yes. And you were able to tell Karen? That her ancestors, David and Violet, were enslaved at Sharswood. That was tough. So did you call Fred? I did. I don't think he believed me in the beginning. <laughs> I didn't believe him. <laughs> so the connection suddenly is made with your family slavery right. in this house. In this house. And you own it. Once I realized that it was actually my blood that was here, it took on a whole new meaning for mm -hmm. me. It really saddens me sometimes when I you know, and I'm up, a lot of times I'm up wee hours of the night now just thinking about what happened here. 
As news spread through the family, there was sadness. But that's not all there was. I almost felt like I was losing my breath for a moment. It was almost like a feeling of being found. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is where I started. And as black people, we don't always know where we started. So here we are sitting in this house. Can't believe it. I can't believe it that I'm in the plantation house <laughs> of my, the plantation that my family was enslaved. You're laughing as if this cannot be cannot true. Be. That's right, but it is. I felt, I feel complete. Wow. I'm not half of a human being anymore. They make me whole, even if I don't know them. I felt a connection to them at Sharswood. I touched the tree, I hugged the tree. And I said, oh my God, you was here when my ancestor when was here. here. I wonder which ancestor of mine touched the tree. I didn't know what to say or do. I just hugged the tree and felt like I'm home. He shared the news with Bill Thompson, who had had that hunch all those years ago. I look at it that I've been a servant to this farm and this house my whole life. And for the Miller family to come back home to my home, our home. Our home, absolutely. It's great. It's a celebration of, of coming home. This is God. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where we're supposed to be. It's like a full circle, like it was meant to happen. Mm -hmm. To me, it was like it was meant to happen. The Millers also see the hand of their ancestors in all of this. I think there had to be because mm -hmm. I did everything and I did everything in my power to make this fail. <laughs> did not make it happen. Yeah. 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 I tried to mess it up at every <laughs> angle. Yeah, I felt like that. <laughs> but those ancestors had one more surprise in store. With all the revelations, there was one question that continued to gnaw at Dexter. Where were his enslaved ancestors buried? So last winter, he asked Bill. I said, Bill, is one question that's been bothering me. Where is the slave cemetery? He said, Dexter, uh, it's right over there. I said, right over where? He said, you see those trees over there? So did you just go right up there then? We went right up there. The trees Bill Thompson pointed to, just beyond Fred's property, sure didn't look like a cemetery. That is, until you start to look closely. Is that one of the... That's one, that's one of them right there. Oh, that's my the God. Headstone. As you can see, this is the um, indention right there. Um, the headstone there, maybe this is the foot stone on the other end. Yeah. There's always seemed like to be oh, there's one. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Poking up through the leaves all around us were pointed rocks, some small, some medium-sized. No names, no engraving, just plain anonymous markers of many, many lives. Wow. This is astonishing. It it's is. It's kind of overwhelming, isn't it? It, it is. is. It really it is. is. I mean, we all live in the same area. We come past this place, and we would not know that our ancestors were right there beside us the entire time. Fred, if you hadn't bought that house? Right. You're right. If I hadn't bought that house, we'd never know. Never. Never. So how has all of this affected you? It's, uh, it's changed me. It's definitely changed me. Um, you ever angry? I get a little, little bit upset sometimes um, when I find out things that I should have known already. Um, angry at I, yourself? At myself and at the system, because I think that we should have known more. What about the school system? Should have known more. Family? Should have known more, mm -hmm. absolutely. You want the story of slavery told? I want the story of slavery told. It's important. So this was converted from a door to a window? Yeah, yeah. So Fred wants to do whatever's necessary to preserve the slave house. You know, this has been exposed for, you know, 200 years. Yeah, right. He's in the process of setting up a nonprofit to make that possible. That's, that's important to me, too, because I know a whole lot of emphasis on that, on that big white house there. Oh, well, exactly. But this right here is really near <laughs> well, and dear to me. This is the story. Right? Yeah, this, this is the story right here. Story. Yeah, absolutely. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight right here. And he's been thinking about the cemetery, too. I can imagine this being someone young. 
we have to do something about this. Yeah, have to. And I will. I'm going to fix it. Do you think you might allow historians to come and... Absolutely. And Absolutely. This place will be open to anyone who wants to learn. Anyone. Anyone can come here. Mm -hmm. But for now, Sharswood is serving the purpose Fred bought it for in the first place, gathering the Miller family together in celebration. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. What do you think Violet and David would think they could see? that you own this place. Yeah, I'm, hope, I'm hoping they would be proud of us, and I think they would be. They endured a lot. I mean, yeah. I can't even imagine what they went through. Happy Looking down on us now. They must be smiling at us. Since our story first aired, Fred Miller took a new job in Virginia to be closer to his family. He has set up a nonprofit Sharswood Foundation to maintain the slave quarters and cemetery and has begun offering tours of the house. No one can say when human remains began surfacing in Clearwater, Florida. There was the pipeline crew that churned up bones in a trench. Later, Remains of the dead were found at an elementary school, a swimming pool, and an office building. It seemed like a curse for what had been done in the name of progress and greed in the old segregated South. The truth of what happened in the 40s and 50s was meant to stay buried, but in a neighborhood called Clearwater Heights, residents with long memories recognized a grave injustice. In the first half of the 20th century, Clearwater Heights was a black neighborhood, thriving, proud, and anchored by faith. Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, Bethany CME, and New Zion Missionary Baptist Church were all located on the Heights. And so is St. Matthew's Baptist, where we heard stories of childhood in the Heights, including those of Diane Stevens, and Eleanor Breland. They had businesses, barbershops, uh, there were hairdressers over there. There was a cab company. It only had one cab, but it was still a cab company. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right there on Greenwood, they had different places where even Ray Charles performed there. Also, James Brown performed up there. But even the famous could not stay in a white Clearwater hotel or walk on the beach, or swim in the bay. Segregation bound their lives and exiled even their memory to segregated graveyards. How many of you believe you have ancestors in one of these cemeteries? About half of you. The segregated cemeteries of Clearwater were sacred ground until the ground became valuable. In the 1950s, Headlines announced that the city of Clearwater made a deal on moving a Negro cemetery. Hundreds of African-American bodies were to be reburied to make way for a swimming pool. A department store was planned for the site of another black cemetery, where again the bodies were to be moved. But O'Neill Larkin remembers, many years later, his first revelation that something was terribly wrong. It's not an imaginary thing that I've seen. It's what I've seen with my own eyes. Larkin, 82 years old, watched a construction crew in 1984 dig a trench through the site of a relocated black cemetery. But I remember um, the parking lot where the engineers, traffic engineer, was cutting the lines through, and they cut through two coffins. That was my first knowledge of seeing it because I walked out there and I seen it myself. In 2019, the Tampa Bay Times reported many segregated cemeteries in Florida had been essentially paved. It was then that the modern city of Clearwater decided to exhume the truth. 
people deserve to be treated with respect. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. Rebecca O'Sullivan and Aaron McKendry are archaeologists for a company called Cardno. Cardno was hired by the city to map the desecration. These individuals were loved. They were family members. They were fathers and mothers. And they were interred with love. McKendry and O'Sullivan pushed ground-penetrating radar over a segregated cemetery where this office site stands today. This overlay shows part of their discovery, 328 likely graves, many under the parking lot, perhaps a few under the building, and more there on the right beneath South Missouri Avenue. 550 graves are in the cemetery's record, McKendry and O'Sullivan found evidence of 11 having been moved in the 1950s. So there may be hundreds of bodies still at that site. It's possible. Not far away, the archaeologists probed another former cemetery. Where there's more what looks like the intact like, graves. That Here, in the 1950s, rather than integrate the white community pool, the city said it would move hundreds of bodies to build a black swimming pool and a black school. But the bodies weren't removed. But the bodies were not removed. Cardinal found the proof last year. It excavated just deep enough to confirm what ground penetrating radar had suggested. It is their resting place. A prayer was said over the site. Then, they planed the sand and sieved a century of time in search of grave markers or tributes. Inevitably, relics included human remains, teeth at the office building site, and bones at the school, which had closed in 2008 because it was obsolete. Are there grave sites underneath the school? All of the information and the data that we collected does indicate that there are additional burials likely below the footprint of that school building. I would be very surprised if they didn't find any bones when they were oh, they had to. O'Neill Larkin watched the excavation and imagined the groundbreaking at the school construction site in 1961. To dig the foundation to put this school upon, they had to hit some form of, of remains. It's likely some families could not afford a tombstone, but the archaeologists found graves were marked. Doesn't that look like one of those metal plaque things? This is a marker that would have been used initially after the burial if a stone was not ready to be placed. And in some cases, this is all that would have been used to mark the location of a burial. Aaron this McKendry showed us Cardinal's catalog of evidence. It's a mercury dime. It is a mercury dime. This dime, new and 42, was among many tributes left with the dead. We also found this brass wedding ring at approximately the same location and the same depth as the dime. 71. The tributes and disturbed human remains were carefully reburied exactly where they were found, pending a decision on what to do next. If you could speak, to these people who were interred and then lost, what would you tell them? I hear you. I'm working. I want to recognize the contributions, the life you lived. I recognize and see your humanity. The cheapest land, the worst places. Anthropologist Antoinette Jackson leads the African American Burial Ground Project at the University of South Florida. She's building a database of desecrated cemeteries. Not just Clearwaters nationally, from New York all the way out toward Texas and all the way down to South Florida, where these cemeteries have been built over, uh, erased, marginalized, underfunded, and need support in order to make, uh, make them whole and have this history known. This is not an isolated story, unfortunately. So far, Jackson has listed about 70 effaced black cemeteries nationwide. Underneath the current housing... Under housing, freeways, and the county-owned parking lot of Tropicana Field, home to baseball's Tampa Bay Rays. 
what we want to bring forward is the memory, the knowledge that these sites were there, these places, these cemeteries, these families were there, lived, died, worked, contributed to our country, to their communities, to our hometowns. Is there evidence of white cemeteries being lost, abandoned, forgotten in the way that these are? There are abandoned cemeteries across the board. There are cemeteries that are not only African-American cemeteries or black cemeteries that have been in some way desecrated. But the issue is more acute with black cemeteries because of issues like slavery, segregation, in which this particular community were legally and intentionally considered lesser than or marginalized by law. When a cemetery disappears, what is lost? Hmm. History. 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 Respect. A great deal of respect yes. because you can no longer visit all right. And bring closure to your own soul. A cemetery is supposed to be your final resting yeah. place. Honorable place. Yeah. Final. In Clearwater, they're debating how to honor those entombed beneath the school, South Missouri Avenue, and the property of the Frank Crum Company, which bought its headquarters for its staffing business decades after the cemetery was erased. I'm sure that when they purchased that property, they didn't know that there were bodies there. No so the head would be facing Zebby Atkinson heads the Clearwater NAACP. What would you say to someone who might make the argument that disturbing Missouri Avenue, disturbing the Frank Crum Corporation, disturbing the schools, way too much effort mm. at this point in time? I would say that that's not their call. They have no family buried there. Atkinson is helping lead the conversation of what to do now among descendants, businesses, and the city. Some people want to have the bodies moved to a place where they can properly memorialize them. Some of the descendant community wants to let the people stay where they are. Those are the type of things that need to be worked out. How do you work them out? We have to sit and talk about it. I mean, it, there is no easy answer with that. Whether the failure in the last century to move the graves was deceit, incompetence, or indifference, we do not know. But today, Clearwater is spending $270,000 to learn the truth. The city told us it is searching for a compromise that will honor the dead. The Frank Crum Company told us it wants to be part of the community's solution. Ideas include monuments, but for a few, like O'Neill Larkin, there's only one route to justice. Tear it down. Tear the building down. Tear it down. Tear down that building as far as I'm concerned. Tear the school down. Make it a shrine of memories that people can go and use it in a proper way of remembering to treat them with more dignity than what this has been treated. We noticed dignity was treated gently in the white cemeteries of Clearwater. In this one, we found a monument to a Confederate soldier, his grave decorated today with a fresh banner of racism. But when this Confederate sacred ground found itself blocking the road to progress, the small cemetery under those trees in the middle was granted a reverent circular detour. Of those citizens buried in the black cemeteries of Clearwater, we have images of only these. The Reverend Arthur L. Jackson, the Reverend Joseph Hines, and Mac Dixon Sr., who was buried beside his wife Florence, three children, and two grandchildren. We do not know the faces of 500 more who remain forever bound by segregation and lost to the memory of time. The death of George Floyd in the hands of Minneapolis police came on Memorial Day. 99 years before, that same week, black Americans suffered a massacre in the days after World War I, a neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma, called Greenwood, 
was among the wealthiest black communities. Oil made Greenwood rich, but jealousy made it suffer. In 1921, a white mob with incendiary rage burned Greenwood to ash. Even memories were murdered when the dead were dropped into unmarked graves. Last December, before the pandemic, we found Tulsa preparing to embrace a reckoning with a plan to exhume the truth and raise the dead. So the community that is Greenwood has thriving businesses, professional offices, doctors, lawyers, dentists. The history of John W. Franklin also. speaks of Greenwood the in the present tense. Greenwood is the nexus of that African-American community. Perhaps because he studied Greenwood in 32 years as a historian at the Smithsonian, or likely because Greenwood is personal. And my grandfather moves here from Rentersville in February 1921. And he's the first person in the family to go to college, Buck Colbert Franklin. Buck Colbert Franklin was a lawyer who chased his dream to a promised land. Booker T. Washington named Greenwood Negro Wall Street because the district was lined with black-owned shops, restaurants, two newspapers, a 54-room grand hotel, a hospital, and the Dreamland Theater, which would soon boast air conditioning. But on the day after Memorial Day, 1921, Buck Franklin awoke to fearful news. He hears that there's to be possibly a lynching. There's this black man who's been caught with this white woman in the elevator, and the newspapers are saying, read all about it. There's extra, extra, read all about it. Tulsa's white newspapers told of a black teenager who allegedly attacked a white female elevator operator. At the jail, a lynch mob demanded the prisoner. Black veterans of World War I arrived to shield the defendant for his day in court. A shot was fired, and in a running gun battle, the mob chased the black vets to Greenwood. One of the moments during the riot that your grandfather wrote about was this. On they rushed, whooping to the tops of their voices, firing their guns every step they took. What is it like for you to read those words today? He too was traumatized by seeing people being shot in front of his eyes. He describes a woman who's trying to find her child who's run in front of her, and she's unafraid of the bullets raining down because her concern is to find her child. What began as an attempted lynching at the jail erupted into a massacre. From a high grain elevator, a machine gun laid fire on Greenwood Avenue. Where's the fire department? Where's the police when we need them? We're part of a city. This is not some small town. This is a city of wealth and order and governance. It is now taken over by a mob. The police joined the mob. National Guard troops pressed the attack against what one guard officer called the enemy. Quotes from eyewitnesses include, old women and men, children, were running and screaming everywhere. A deputy sheriff reported a black man dragged behind a car his head was being bashed in, the deputy said, bouncing on the steel rails and bricks. But what happened next may have frightened Buck Franklin even more. And he hears planes circling and sees roofs of buildings catching fire. And these are from turpentine balls, burning turpentine balls dropped from planes. The first time in American history, uh, the airplanes were used to terrorize America it was not a 9-11, was not at Pearl Harbor. It was right here in the Greenwood District. Reverend Robert Turner's Vernon AME Church was among at least five churches burned, along with 1,200 homes. A photo was crudely and imperfectly hand-lettered at the time, running the Negro out of Tulsa. 36 odd square blocks, city blocks, was destroyed. And before they destroyed it, they looted. They took nice furniture, money. 
When the black hospital burned, white hospitals refused to take Greenwood's wounded. Those who bled to death included Greenwood's most prominent surgeon. Ultimately, one hospital did make space in its basement for black casualties. The number of dead is estimated between 150 and 300. Survivors included 10,000 now homeless African Americans. 6,000 of them were herded into internment camps and then released weeks later. I don't know how they did it, uh, but the following Sunday after the massacre, they came and worshiped in our basement. And that's the same basement that we have today. The death of a black man at the hands of police is today shouted into the national memory. Thanks to all of you for being here. But in 1921, it remained possible to erase a genocide. I grew up attending segregated Tulsa public schools. Never in any of the schools was anything ever said about it. The congregation of Vernon AME Church is two generations beyond 1921, but they too were victimized. This was not taught no. in the public school. No. You never heard about this in you class. You never heard a word about it. When I went to OU in 1998, I was sitting in a class of African American history, and the professor was talking about this place where black people had businesses and had money and had doctors and lawyers, and he said it was in Tulsa. And I, I raised my hand, I said, no, I'm from Tulsa. I, that's not accurate. And he was talking about this massacre, riot. I said, man, what are you talking about? I said, I went to school on Greenwood. I've never heard of this ever. How many people were arrested, tried, for what happened in Greenwood? No one. Two or 300 people murdered, an entire community burned to the ground and the police were unable to find a single person. It's a real tragedy. All the thousands of claims that were filed by African Americans, not a one, not a one insurance company paid that claim. And our church was included. No insurance honored for black Tulsans, no arrests made, no complete count of the dead. The Salvation Army recorded only that it fed 37 grave diggers. The nameless were buried in unmarked graves while their families were locked down in the internment camps. I wonder if there are any doubts in this room about whether there are mass graves in Tulsa, Oklahoma. No doubts. My great-grandmother... Oral histories passed down generations pointed to at least four sites of possible mass graves. As a mayor, I view it as a homicide investigation. Phase one. G.T. Bynum is Tulsa's Republican mayor. In 2018, he ordered an investigation of all remaining evidence. What you have is a case of law and civil order being overrun by people who were filled with hatred. We believe at the end of this road we're walking down right now is one of the sites uh, where we found an anomaly. Anomalies of disturbed earth showed up in the studies of Scott Hammerstead. That's not a mower, it's ground penetrating radar. And right here is the anomaly as we He's see He's a senior it. researcher at the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey. The anomalies that we're looking at, what are those? It's just contrast between uh, the, sur the surrounding soil that's undisturbed and then this soil that has been disturbed. So we're not seeing in these images human remains? No, no, it's definitely not like CSI. You don't see individual skeletons. You just see disturbances and contrasts, which is why you can't really say necessarily that for sure it's a common grave, but it's very consistent with one. Of course, there's any number of things it could be. That's always the, the thing I have to remind myself. And there's only one way to find out. That is exactly right. We have to dig, we have to dig. But we don't know what's underneath a 10-day test excavation is scheduled to begin in July, led by University of Florida forensic anthropologist Phoebe Stubblefield. She'll investigate cause of death, but it's complicated because of the Spanish flu pandemic from the same period. So just because you find a burial site, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's from the massacre. 
Correct. And so I'm interested in markers like signs of violence or any kind of um, ballistic injuries or chop injuries. Can you retrieve DNA? If it's a good preservation state, there's a high probability. Would it be possible, in your opinion, to actually identify some of these people? We could try for genealogical matches. So if we had people now who say, oh, I'm missing a relative from that time period, here's my DNA, then we can make uh, matches through similar markers and do the genealogical matches. There's a long legacy from 1921. Tulsa is still one of the most segregated cities mm. in the country. Yes. The north part of Tulsa is black, the south part is white, and the twain don't meet very much. Right, because uh, of the history of uh, racial disparity that exists in our city, a kid that's growing up in the predominantly African-American part of our city is expected to live 11 years less than a kid that's growing up in a wider part of the city. By the way, Tulsa is not unique in that regard. You see disparities like that in major cities all around America. The test excavation is expected to discover whether there are human remains. Next steps would include recovery and the question of how to honor those who have waited nearly 100 years for justice. How do you commemorate an event that gives dignity and honor to the people who've been lost? We have taken in recent decades in our memorials to etch the names of every single person who was lost. The 9-11 memorial, the Vietnam memorial. That's not gonna be possible here. We don't know the names. We don't know the names. And uh, you're going to have to do some kind of, you know, uh, we have the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So it has to be something that is representative of lost souls, lost in anonymity. Um, something like that will have to be planned. At a time when we're having a national discussion about how black history fits into the American mosaic, we discovered that many stories of black achievement are slipping away, going unpreserved for future generations. A nonpartisan, nonprofit organization called The History Makers is hoping to change that by creating an expansive digital archive of first person accounts. Founder Juliana Richardson told us. She's determined to document the black experience in America one story at a time. In society today, what is being debated? Who has value and who doesn't? You preserve what has value. You throw away what doesn't. That's why the preservation is so critical. Juliana Richardson has been preserving black American stories for the past two decades. Mm -hmm. One day, she's interviewing the first black president of Rutgers University, Jonathan Holloway. What things did you find out about? Well, the sort of the daily racism my siblings dealt with. Another day, it's Brandeis University professor yeah. Anita Hill. In three counties, the census takers actually bothered to list the slaves by name. And that's how I met and found out who my great-great-grandparents were. Hill, known for her testimony against Clarence Thomas, wasn't easy to get. It's been a long time coming. I'm really happy to have you here. Why is it important to have these first-person accounts? How else are you going to know what really has happened in the black community? if you don't allow the community to speak for itself. You've called these America's missing stories. They are. They're America's missing stories. And American history won't be complete without them. Richardson and her small staff in Chicago have created the country's largest collection of African-American oral histories. There are more than 3,500 interviews so far. Each one is transcribed, then posted online. It's a who's who of black America. There are luminaries like poet Maya Angelou. I'm not speaking to blacks and blacks alone, 
or tall women or fat or thin or short. No, I'm to everybody. And there are rising stars like a young Barack Obama. Who would you say has influenced you most in your life? Richardson interviewed him when he was an Illinois state senator. Not just Dr. King or Malcolm X, but Bob Moses and Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Rosa Parks. Think about this. This is like 2001 by 2008, he's president of the United States. It's extraordinary. Extraordinary is a good way to describe the breadth and depth of the collection. You want to hear something real crazy? Yes. <laughs> Not long before he died, bass baritone William Warfield gave an impromptu performance in German while recounting his Vienna performance of Showboat that brought down the house. Er muss nicht schuften, nicht baumwollflügen. Everybody who sees this is sort of enthralled. Juliana Richardson says as a child, all she knew of black history was that her great-grandfather had been enslaved. She grew up in a predominantly white Ohio town and told us when she was nine, she was the only black student in her class. You had not been taught anything about black American history in school? Nothing. Mm -mm. But I'm not the only one. No, I I wasn't either. It's a common story. As a sophomore at Brandeis, she traveled to New York's Schomburg Library for a project on the Harlem Renaissance. She had an epiphany while listening to a song she thought was about President Harry Truman. I learned for the first time that this song is written by a black songwriting team of Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake in the 1921 production of Shuffle Along on Broadway. I mean, it was like, whoa. And I'm listening to the music. I'm just wild about Harry. Harry's wild about me. And it was like it opened appetite. And I'm reading, and I'm studying, and I'm listening, and I'm hearing. I'm hearing these things that I had no knowledge of Mm. for the first time. The spark was lit, but didn't catch fire. Her father had wanted her to be a lawyer. After Harvard Law School, she had a successful career as a corporate lawyer and cable entrepreneur, but she was restless. I was in my mid-40s. I didn't have children. You get to a point in your life when you start asking, you know, what is going to be your leave behind? What is going to be your legacy? And I wanted to do good in my life. As she mulled her future, she went to a legal conference in Memphis and heard the Reverend Billy Kiles, who was on the hotel balcony with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he was assassinated. Richardson realized there were lots of important stories like his. At that moment, the name, the history makers came to me, and I came back and I was like, I know what I'm going to do. It's called The History Makers, and it's going to be an archive of black people. In the beginning, did you have a lot of well, uh, they, encouragement? They, my friends did an intervention. They literally did an intervention. With no money, no formal training in oral history or professional archiving, she launched The History Makers in 1999. At first, it wasn't easy to get people to share their intimate stories with a stranger, but she convinced a Tuskegee Airman, Colonel Bill Thompson. We were flying now with white guys. He says, have you heard of the Golden 13? And I said, no, Colonel Thompson, I've never heard of the Golden 13. And he said, where they were the Navy's version of the Tuskegee Airmen. And he said, four left living in this country, and one lives upstairs, and he wants to talk to you also. And it was just at that point that I, you know, I knew we are at a point of discovery. By 2012, she had discovered so much, the archive had grown so vast, the collection so significant, the Library of Congress agreed to become its permanent repository, alongside the only other project of its magnitude, the WPA slave narratives recorded during the Great Depression. I go, oh my God. The stories of the formerly enslaved and the stories of the progeny of the formerly enslaved are all together. In the Library of Congress. In the Library of Congress. Yep. Doesn't get better than that. Juliana Richardson is not one to rest on her laurels. When she's not conducting interviews or researching new subjects, she's even working on me, she's fundraising. 
Every interview cost us $6,000 to process. When she realized the archive needed more athletes, she persuaded the NFL to donate hundreds of hours of its own interviews with black players. Last year, she landed Hall of Fame wide receiver Jerry Rice, who couldn't believe he got the call. Because it's almost just like going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This is big for me. Rice showed us the 49ers Museum in their home stadium. So what's with all these footballs? Well, these represent all my touchdowns. <laughs> all of this? Yeah, all of this right here. He scored 208 touchdowns over 20 seasons, still an NFL record. He played in four Super Bowls, won three, and snagged a Super Bowl MVP. But Rice said the history makers wanted to know as much about his upbringing in rural Mississippi. Did you have plumbing, indoor plumbing? Uh, no, we did. It was outdoor. He told us poverty fueled his drive for success. We were very poor, very poor. Uh, my father was a bricklayer, and he would take me to work with him during the summer. Very demanding work. I used to be up on this scaffold that was probably about 20 feet in the air, and my, my brothers down below, they would toss the bricks up, and I would snatch the bricks out of the air. And I always prided myself on, you know, being that really strong link. What's important about your story for anybody who starts searching? For you. With the younger generation, when they see someone, you know, who looks like them and say, hey, look, that guy, he made it, that might be that little, that little kick, that little nudge to make them work a little bit harder. Juliana Richardson believes stories of struggle and success are powerful motivators for all races, especially young minds. So she's convinced more than 180 colleges and universities to subscribe to History Makers. And she recently rolled out a new curriculum for schools in New York, Atlanta, Chicago, and Charlotte. Did you know immediately that you wanted to use it in the classroom? Yes, I did. Last spring, we visited teacher Rachel Davis and her social studies class at O.W. Huth Middle School near Chicago. The student body is largely African-American, and many had lost family members in the pandemic. Sometimes in one household, it was three or four, a grandparent, an aunt, a cousin. Um, and then we had students who were starting to have a lot of anxiety, depression. Davis saw the perfect salve in the History Makers curriculum from lost to thriving. She had her students browse the archives and pick History Makers who had overcome adversity. Who did you end up choosing for your project? Uh, I chose the Honorable Blanche M. Manning. She's a uh, United States uh, District Court judge. Elena Williams, she's a sports reporter. Rodney Atkins, she's a uh, part of the IBM industry. Andre Samuel, Lauren Rounds, and Tyler Rush told us they found the record of black achievement to be richer and more diverse than they had ever imagined or been taught. From maybe kindergarten to sixth grade, we heard this MLK, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, the same people, Madam C.J. Walker, the same people. Has it changed now that you've met some people who may not have been in the history books? It's a lot uh, easier to actually see what we went through and how we persevered through it, and it just shows how strong we are, really. And think about this. What if I had had our archives back when I was nine? When you were that nine-year-old girl. Think about that. I mean, there was actually black history in my town just yards from where I was. There was a man named Shackelford who sat at with his gunpoint, daring the white community to tear down his school for black kids. Mm. The fifth president of Liberia was born in Newark, Ohio. In your in hometown? Eight, in my hometown in 1815. I'm thinking there's no black history, but it was all around me. And that's what the kids, it's all around them. But they don't know it. They don't touch it, so they can't aspire to be what they don't really see. But now, because of your archives, they can know. They can. That's got to be rewarding. Yes, it is. But our work is not done. Juliana Richardson is now on a mission to collect and digitize the papers of history makers. These belong to entertainer Eartha Kitt, and she found a willing partner in Ford Foundation president Darren Walker. This organization is indeed a national treasure, 
And you, Juliana, are a national treasure. And so I'm very, very happy to make this pledge of a million dollars to your great work. I've worked 24-7 for 22 years, and I'm surrounded by these such rich stories. Till I take my last breath, I mean, they will always be a part of me. And the little girl, I mean, I'm now a very richly endowed person that no one can tell me that me and my people don't have tremendous value. No one can tell me that, ever.